I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. Today, I'm filming from my new outdoor wedding pagoda before I leave for the East Coast and my hometown of Cumberland, where it is snowing. I'd like to talk today to compare the point system, which is something that I developed when my daughters were young, to the carrot system, which is what I use in my book, How to Dismantle an Empire, as a means of restoring our local sovereignty through a new economic model. Lately, I've been noticing a lot more interest in decentralized models. This is something that Russell Brand and I have always shared, that he's looking at how do we make self-governance work at a small scale. And today, Robert Malone published a piece called Enabling a Decentralized Model, which has sparked a lot of good conversation. And one of the comments on that thread, I'll be quoting at the conclusion. The word economy comes from the Greek economia, which means the management of a household. I think that any kind of system that works needs to be able to start at the smallest possible unit of community, which is the family, and then be able to scale up. Whether you're talking about three people or 300,000 people, I think the principles of reciprocity are the same. And so this all started for me when my daughter, the one who just got married at 30, was at the end of second grade and we were in a battle of wills and I was losing badly. If you're a parent, you probably are familiar and have read like I did <laughs> as fast as you can about systems of consequences and how to make whatever the transgression is be related to the consequences. Now, if you can do that, you are smarter than me because I could not outthink three Machiavellian midgets who had nothing better to do with their time than to try to get what they wanted without giving me what I wanted. The event that triggered my crisis in parenting was that I came back from a piano camp in Vermont and I had left my ring on the piano in the garage mahal where I am now in a cute little tooth fairy box where I put it because it annoyed me when I was playing and I didn't want to risk losing it. I come back, open the box to find a glittery pipe cleaner ring. The girls, led by Veronica, had taken it out into the grass and decided to surprise me by making these little pipe cleaner rings. They didn't remember a ring falling into the grass. So we used a metal detector in vain, but in truth, I had been doing a lot of research into the relationship between South Africa and blood diamonds, and my ring had made me kind of queasy. So the ring itself wasn't such a deal breaker, but it hadn't been the only time that Veronica hadn't listened to me when the consequences could have been much, much worse. I remember a time with her running with her baby sister in her arms over a cement airport floor and not stopping when I asked her to. So it seemed to me that we were in an escalating cycle of her being defiant and of me trying to think up bigger and bigger consequences that could make her see that she needed to listen. What I did in response was that I threw away her Pokemon collection, I took her out of an after-school program, and I devoted myself, it must be said, to making her life miserable by spending as much time as possible with her. Another mentor who was also a mom of three daughters once told me if there's one that you really don't want to spend time with, the answer is to go closer. As usual, she was right. But the most important thing I did was that I developed what I called the point system. And this was a spreadsheet that tracked different ways in which my daughters earned money. It couldn't be in any relationship to chores because that was what you were expected to do to be part of the family. 
it wasn't in relationship to schoolwork because that was something that you did for yourself. But these were things that they were doing for me, which was 15 minutes of piano practice or music practice or doing workbook pages. This gave them something that they could do on top of the things that they needed to do anyway in order to earn what we called points. Points had a variable exchange rate depending on how they were spent. So if they were spent on toys, candy, junk, it was about a dollar a point. If it was books, it might be $3 a point. If it was fair trade clothing, maybe five, donating to some cause, maybe 10. Points could also be lost, sometimes for doing something they had been told not to, or for not doing something that I had asked them to do a couple of times. So rather than me haranguing them, I would be saying, hey, I'm sorry, but if I need to ask you a third time to come, I'm going to need to take a point. This would be something that was replaceable. It gave them a way of saying, ooh, that hurt, but I can earn it back. I think there was only one time I can recall when they lost points without warning, which was spilling nail polish on the rug. In high school, this transitioned into watching Democracy Now! or documentaries that I'd assign and having great conversations with me about them. This enabled a way that we developed more of a rapport even after they had gone to college because what this did was give them a certain amount immediately, but it put a much bigger chunk into their savings. So my daughters ended up earning from me their way through college and at a pace that was, I hoped, sustainable. It enabled us to always have something that they were doing in order to get the thing that they wanted. So my daughters would never say, hey, I need this. Can you get it for me? They would say, hmm, can you cut me a deal? And that was a much easier way for me of being able to parent and supply them with the things that they wanted or needed and make it negotiable. My daughters also could have taken the money that they had earned towards college and used it for a down payment on a house and educated themselves. That was something none of them took me up on. How does the carrot system that looks at social change relate to the point system that I used for my family? In the point system, what I'm trying to do is develop kids who are an asset to the family, who know how to take responsibility, and who know how to earn the things that they want. In the carrot system, what we're trying to do is foster adults. We want home ownership, because that's not a passive investment. That's something where you have to take responsibility for the property, everything in it, for the land and everything growing on it, whether you want it to or not. You take responsibility for the neighborhood, for the community. If the sewage lines clog, there is no one to call. That's the kind of environment that we're trying to foster. We want people who are taking responsibility for small businesses, not being employees who then are complaining about wanting better treatment. We want people who are small local landlords. We don't want renters who are looking at that being someone else's responsibility and that being corporations that own all the housing. As a community, housing is the intergenerational transfer of wealth. You don't want to just give it away. What the carrot system does is take all of the aggregate mortgages and redistribute them as subsidies for the things that you want to encourage that pay for, in a way, the chores of being part of that community household. And I categorize these as well care, taking care of elders, of children, of each other's health, and then education, because everyone can teach and everyone can learn. I look at home improvement 
and how we should be subsidizing that so that people are improving the properties on which they live. And then food production, something that is feeding people with locally produced food and also improving the soil and making sure that that land is passed on in a better form. Not everyone in your community is going to be earning those subsidies. Some people may be working for corporations, some may be retired, and that's great because that makes sure that there's enough in circulation so that people who are doing the ordinary work of supporting the community know that they can earn as much as it costs for the cost of housing. In another parallel to the point system, there's also a variable exchange rate. If someone is coming in from the outside with dollars and trying to buy housing or rent housing, it will be $2 for every carat because all of your housing is going to be priced in carats in your community currency. But if you're a resident and you're bringing in dollars, we can give you an exchange rate of one to one up to a certain limit that is equal to the cost of living there. That way you can pay with carrots that have no income tax and no sales tax other than your social security pension, which really isn't a tax, is really just a way of saving for your future. But there's also a variable rate depending on how they're spent. So if you're buying the equivalent of foreign made toys and candy, then that's going to cost you double. It's going to cost you twice as much. But if all of your necessities are being covered with no income tax and no sales tax, you can afford for those luxury items to be paying an extra amount. Another parallel to the system is that you can save for a down payment on a house or for college or whatever else you want. In addition to the social security, there's also a way that you can put aside savings and be able to get a good rate of return on them. And in other episodes, I've explained how that's possible for us to do. That enables you to be able to borrow back from yourself and lose nothing except for the rate of interest during the interim. One of my readers has the byline, what else are they lying to us about? And I think that could be the mantra for this age because fear is both being used to manipulate us and to move us closer to those things that we're afraid of whether that's pandemics or economic collapse, war or nuclear Armageddon. This is not, I think, really a deterrent because some things are just too big to be worrying about. Like if you run carrying your baby sister and fall, her head could explode like a pumpkin. That's not really going to stop you because you can't really think about that. Instead, what the carrot system and the point system do is make things small and incremental. So it gives an incentive for positive changes. Rather than worrying about climate change, you can just feed your neighbors in a hundred different ways. And in doing that, you can support regenerative agriculture. You can be doing things like teaching people anything that they want to know. You can be helping your neighbors fix up old houses and make them more safe. And rather than the planning department getting in your way, they can give you money to help you with that. You can also be providing alternative health care. And that's something that enables us to be working directly with willing and eager clients and be able to get the kind of advice that we want rather than what they think we should have. Even the disincentives are small and incremental unless you're a multinational bank or an investment fund, in which case it may be rather abrupt that your money isn't taken from you but isn't worth the same amount because it can't be used to take away the assets from small communities. 
I think that's a trade-off worth having. To finish the story about Veronica, years later, I was invited to the wedding of the woman who had been my house cleaner at the time. I noticed that her daughter wasn't present, who had worked with her when she was here. And she told me privately that, tragically, her daughter had become addicted when she was in high school and had a much older boyfriend who was in prison for felony theft. I realized that that was the time and she was the one who would have been cleaning my garage and that Veronica had been falsely accused. But by then, I was already saying that I had lost a diamond to gain a gem of a daughter. By then, we cleaned the house together as a family, and no one could live up to Veronica's standards in that. In addition, she became the most thoughtful and considerate person I know, and fortunately for me, also the most forgiving, the one thing at which she is utterly incompetent, is holding a grudge. I think the time is coming when diamonds are going to lose their luster for all of us, and instead our relationships are going to be the gems. There is a comment that a woman named Bettina wrote on Robert Malone's article, Enabling a Decentralized World, and it reads, Yes, one can feel it in the air. Only when the time is right, such changes can happen. On the contrary, if time is not right, one can try as hard as possible, but nothing happens. I believe it is out of our control when the time is right. There are so many influences, natural and supernatural, earthly and galactic. As Robert recently wrote, a volcano erupts and changes climate. A butterfly just claps with its wing and suddenly changes are born, this time more globally than ever, it seems to me. I am looking forward to meeting you all on the other side. And in preparation for this change, before I lose the light altogether, here is socio-spirituality and small-scale sovereignty, and then also we need to agree to agree not on a solution, but on a process. Thank you for being a subscriber and for watching my video.